My name is Kyle White, and this talk is part of the Bedrock Lectures on Human Rights and Climate Change. The title for my topic is Indigenous Peoples and Climate Justice, and I want to provide an overview of what I think are some of the key issues that Indigenous people face, as well as the actions Indigenous people are doing connected to climate change. And it comes from both my research, but also the standpoint of a Potawatomi person and a member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. So first, Indigenous people have been organizing events for some time. This is the first stewards symposium organized by a number of tribes and partners in Washington, DC. These events raise awareness of a number of threats and issues that Indigenous people face with respect to climate change from sea level rise to more extreme droughts. All of these climate change impacts for many different indigenous people affect culture, economy, political self-determination, traditions, and many other aspects of indigenous experience and indigenous ways of life. And through indigenous activism, as well as changes in how scientists think of their work, there are now many scientific reports that confirm the types of issues and threats that I just mentioned. And so the U.S. Global Change Research Program, for example, in the U.S. National Climate Assessment has a chapter devoted just to indigenous issues with respect to climate change. Indigenous leaders such as Sheila Watt-Cloutier have attempted to express the concerns that indigenous people have about climate change. So instead of about stopping warming, for people in the Arctic, including the community that Sheila Watt-Cloutier comes from, it's about the right to be cold, which concerns their culture, their economy, their self-determination, their traditions, their overall way of life. At the highest human rights levels, Victoria Towley Corpus, the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous people, have said pretty directly that climate change is a major issue that indigenous peoples face. And so I think you're seeing that at all levels of our leadership that we're expressing that climate change is a major issue. But if you look what a lot of indigenous people are also trying to say, there are some important things I'd like to highlight. I've found a number of examples. This one comes from the United Tribes Technical College of trying to actually show that as indigenous people, climate change is not a new topic. For Anishinaabe people, of which Potawatomi people are a part of that larger group, uh, we have long-standing intellectual traditions and social and political philosophies of designing the way our society operates to be adaptive to seasons, as well as interannual environmental changes or changes across years. And so for centuries, uh, indigenous people have known that the way in which you design your society must account for and be respectful to constant environmental change. And so when I think of Anishinaabe people who come from the Great Lakes region, our entire way of life was about being as adaptive and flexible as possible. And that not only included things like making sure that your society was not stagnant and could change in shape and size to adjust to different harvesting needs and storing needs for foods uh, and for medicines, um, but also that your, your language, your, your gender system and other aspects of the social system were also fluid and recognized and respected human difference and human freedom. But for indigenous people, climate change is also not new in another way. Candace Callison, in her book, How Climate Change Comes to Matter, remarks that for non-Native people, you have to think of what the current concern over climate change might mean for people like Indigenous people who have gone through colonialism, especially the ways in which colonialism has facilitated capitalism and industrialization, which in a place like the United States or Canada has been extremely harmful to Indigenous people. So my tribe, for example, we were in the Great Lakes region and had been there for centuries, but the U.S. wanted our land. They wanted the 
Chicago area, the Detroit area, and everything that was in between. And so we were relocated uh, and eventually ended up in Oklahoma. And when we were relocated, that allowed the U.S. to fully industrialize, create large-scale commercial agriculture, create all sorts of technologies that polluted the Great Lakes. Uh, and we know now that these are environmentally harmful, that they're not sustainable economies or ways of life. But it was our people that were removed forcibly to make that happen. Of course, when we got to Oklahoma, that area too became subject to massive settlement and industrial agriculture and the oil industry uh, and other extractive industries that also then caused many indigenous people in Oklahoma, which at the time was the Indian territory when we settled there, but then became the state of Oklahoma, to be dispossessed of their land and to suffer pollution and other environmental harms. And in this image, which I'm pretty sure comes from the Environmental Protection Agency, it shows that for Anishinaabe people who are still living in the Great Lakes, that actually many of those traditions that people still practice today in this region that are dependent on the current climate system in the Great Lakes region, that might change as Michigan actually becomes closer to the climate of Oklahoma. And for indigenous people, you can imagine this creates a different sense of history because it's almost as if, right, the United States is trying to put every native nation into Oklahoma, or at least Anishinaabe people, by bringing Oklahoma to the Great Lakes. And I think this highlights a different type of consciousness. And I read a lot of work by Potawatomi philosopher and scientist Robin Kimmerer, uh, who talks about what it means to have this type of consciousness where we look at climate change not only in terms of a long history of being people that purposely uh, organized our society to adapt but also people who have had climate change imposed on us who have had other environmental changes imposed on us as part of the colonial process and so the current climate change issue we're facing of which we know that the drivers are things like fossil fuel burning, uh, industrialized agriculture, and other sources that were brought about by colonialism and capitalism, that we are experiencing another form of colonialism in the current climate change ordeal. And so this is why many indigenous people are taking direct action. So the village of Kivalina, and this poster comes from a documentary uh, is facing the issue of having to relocate permanently from its place of residence in the Arctic due to climate change impacts. But they've become well known for an attempted lawsuit against the fossil fuel industry. And I mentioned Kivalina because if you look widely at the issue of climate change relocation and indigenous people, it turns out that some of the climate change issues that indigenous people are facing, which might trigger relocation, are ones that maybe their ancestors wouldn't have been concerned about because their ancestors lived in a larger area of land and were much more mobile. And it's colonialism that has made it so that many indigenous people live in smaller areas, such as reservations or small island communities that are more vulnerable to climate change impacts. And so we have to address these issues of colonialism and the laws and policies that today operate to make it hard for indigenous people to negotiate and plan for climate change. For those people that followed the Standing Rock tribe in its actions and ceremonies to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline, it wasn't just an issue of the fact that that single pipeline and the decision to try to build it across Lakota and Dakota land was the problem. It was that the Standing Rock tribe still operates within a political and legal system and a history of land dispossession that makes it hard for them to be able to consent to any type of US business or corporate endeavor that might affect their land. And so the issue of the pipeline cannot be resolved until issues like treaty rights, reconciliation for land dispossession, racism uh, can be addressed in that region, which is why many native people show maps like this, which give in a sense a history of land theft by the United States and how the current boundaries make it hard for people in the tribe to be able to have and exercise self-determination 
over the areas that matter to them and their ancestors. <clears throat> and climate change impacts and the fossil fuel industry are very personal and intimate for Native people. As many folks know who are listening to this, sexual violence has been part of colonialism going back to the origins of U.S. and European colonialism in North America. And Sarah Deer and her collaborators in this article show that actually, if you look at the current fossil fuel industry, when extraction occurs in a particular area, that the man camps that form to support the workers are also places in which indigenous women and children are trafficked in the sex trade and are abused. And so even today, as extractive industries and colonialism moves forward, uh, we see again that repetition of colonial style harms against native people. And so for many of us, climate change is like going back to the future in a sense. And we're constantly proposing solutions. So this issue of Yes Magazine has a number of writings on what it means to decolonize, many of which are relevant to climate change. The Aquasasne Mohawk posted what I think is an extremely innovative climate change plan on their website that shows how we can best be prepared for climate change by going back to some of those traditions that matter to indigenous people and that the US and Canada need to support us in these endeavors to do climate change planning in our own ways. And so I really respect that work. The Treaty Rights at Risk Initiative, which is from the treaty tribes in Western Washington, connects climate change with a number of other environmental change issues that are affecting salmon and other plant and animal populations in the region and shows that it's not enough just to look at climate change or one of these other environmental issues in isolation, but it's still an overall breach of treaty rights that the U.S. and the local governments in the area have still not addressed adequately in their relationship with those tribes. Groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network, Indian Land Tenure Foundation, and Winona LaDuke's work, such as the White Earth Land Recovery Project, all of these are trying to do things like better create self-determination of indigenous people in relation to their lands and waters and fight the fossil fuel industry. And in these activities, what we see is this idea that I call renewing relatives, which we're trying to, again, relate to the environment in ways that are moral, that are consensual, that are trustworthy, in which we respect the agency and the spirituality of the non-human world and design our societies to be adjustable, like I was talking about before, because a society that's adjustable and flexible is one that's really respecting the dynamics of ecosystems. And this is bound up with our collective continuance, our capacity to adapt as people and to be people who can take on challenges without facing harms that we could feasibly be able to deal with. And colonialism attacks our collective industry, our collective continuance. And it makes it possible for us to experience harms and intergenerational traumas that our ancestors would have been able to cope with. So in closing, I have a set of questions that I hope that uh, people might consider. So first, how is it that climate change for indigenous people is an issue of colonialism? Second, why is it that indigenous people continue to be targeted by the fossil fuel industry? And third, how is the idea that for many indigenous people, climate change is not a new topic? How is that significant for how we understand the solutions to climate change for moving forward in the future? That's the end of the presentation. Take care.